Okay, then, why don't we start tonight, and it'll be on Seminar 2, which starts on page 19 and 20. I want to do just a quick reminder of where we started. Now, what we talked about last time, we talked about that there was a nine dot problem there on page 20, that to connect the nine dots using four straight lines without taking our pen from the page. And uh, there are some examples there on page 20 that show us that we're trapped in some sort of system uh, that somehow always fails in being able to achieve uh, the goal. We discussed that at length last time. All I can do is touch on it in brief again this evening. Uh, we'll make use of this again and again, but I want you to see this as an example of man-made systems that we are always trying to, just come on in and find the seat, please. Uh, don't, don't worry about the camera. Come on in. It's the only way to go. I wasn't until you said something. Okay. <laughs> and then, of course, on page 21, as we discussed last time together, there is a solution to the problem that gets us outside of a man-made system, outside of the box, which has to do with both revelation, that it is revelation that comes from outside of the box. And for something outside of our human experience that breaks into our human experience and therefore transforms uh, our entire human reality that we're dealing with. So we discussed that last time and I'm just reminding us of that. Page 22, we also discussed last time together uh, the question of what number comes after 12. And there you see all kinds of numbers, and it depends on which we count by. But each counting system is a system. And the interesting thing is, once you devise a system, you automatically choose to eliminate certain things out of your system. And the further down on that line or graph that you go, you see the greater the loss of stuff inside a system. So a system ends up erasing stuff automatically. Now it can do so in a hostile fashion. Aha, we got rid of the threes. We got rid of 13. Or it can just get rid of them and never tell us. And we're in a system. And so these are different systems. And we mentioned that a vertical agreement. Ah, oh, we've got all these 12s here sometimes creates an illusion that we're talking the same language. When in reality, we're not talking the same language at all. It just looks that way, and that's part of what happens to us. Let me just give you a, a, a quick hint. It's there on page, it's at the top of 23, but I want you to look at 22 if you don't mind for just a second. When you are, or should you, be picking up this National Geographic, or this journal, or that book, each one of those is normally going to represent one of these systems of thought. And when you read them, you realize you're reading different systems. And if you can play a game with them when you read them, try to see if you can float upwards with the system they use and at least peg it on the very top line, if it's there. And somehow, if you read enough of these systems, you can almost discover some things that give you an eye-opener along the way. We're going to maybe do a little of that this evening. I hope. Anyway, what I would like to do now on page 23 is come to Roman numeral 2. I want to talk and discuss God inside the godless box. Where is God inside the godless box? I'm talking again the real world you and I live in. I'm not talking the religious world of church. I'll talk about that side of stuff maybe in part two tonight. But in part one, come on in please, find a seat right up here. We've got room right up here. I want you down close and personal, and let's all be part of this group experience together. But I want to say this. We do not have to be afraid of talking about God in a godless world. 
oh, it might get us fired. Now, there's prudence necessary. Uh, I, I teach in a secular university, and I assure you, I have been called in to the chairman's office for discussing some of the material in class we're going to look at tonight. So, they're well aware of how hot this topic is. You may be going, what in the world is he talking about? So let's see if I can communicate about God in a godless, neutral, secular setting for just a little bit with us. I know, get the excedrin out. This is going to be rough. I can see it coming, right? I'm just going to mention briefly on the bottom of page 23 that there are now revolutionary new frontiers of science. New ideas from the four frontiers of knowledge, the science of mind, brain, genes, and evolution have created a revolution that spells the eventual end of the science and social sciences that were believed and taught in the 20th century. Every one of us in this room, I believe, without looking too closely at anyone's birth certificate, was probably educated in the 20th century. And everything we learn is now so outdated by the new stuff that it's a brand new world. And the old guys, the old scientists fighting their old battles against God, they don't even know there's a new science coming. Because they don't talk to one another. Now, there on page 24, I've kind of summarized that, but I'm not going to take time to go over those tonight. They're just there for your information. I, I footnoted Pinker, and I just realized when I looked at this a while ago that the first footnote on page 23 didn't give you the bibliographical information. You can get it from me later if you want it. This is the book I'm referring to. This is one high-powered neo-evolutionist, uh, I think at MIT. Now, he uses words that, you know, it takes me an hour to figure out what he's talking about sometimes. Uh, but this is who I'm citing when it says Pinker. It's this guy here, and if you want to find that, you can get that information later. Yes? Uh, would you say that this is similar to what people were experiencing, this reworking of how we think about science and the mind and the brain and evolution and everything? Is this similar to the change uh, that people went through during the Enlightenment when the entire system of how people had learned and thought yes. got turned yes. around? Yes, yes, this is a, a huge revolution that is taking place. Uh, I want you to look on Bible page 24. I'll mention just one right here. The fourth new frontier of knowledge is evolutionary psychology that studies phylogenic history and adaptive functions of the mind in hope of understanding the design or purpose of the mind. Uh, the neo-evolutionists are confronting the question of design. Certainly an eye is too well engineered to have arisen by chance, they say. But at the same time, they're quick to say there can't be a creator. So it's an interesting pickle they put themselves in. Nor is the eye a masterpiece of engineering literally fashioned by a cosmic designer who created humans in his own image. But the question of design is at least being asked. And a cosmic designer remains a possibility in their conversation. Now let's talk about the neo-evolutionist box. Stick with me, people, really. Don't get frightened. <laughs> if I can get fired for talking about this because it's too religious, surely you can be kind if it's too scientific. This is the world our children and grandchildren are in. Neo-evolutionists believing only in an empirical world seek their answers inside the box of a physical universe. Natural selection is the only physical process we know of that can simulate engineering because it is the only process in which how well something works can play a causal role in how it came to be. We are outcomes of natural selection. We got here because we inherited traits that allowed our ancestors to survive, find mates, and reproduce. We must be products either of divine design or natural selection. I don't know why it has to be either or, but let's see where we head later. It is important to understand
understand what the neo-evolutionists are saying. Natural selection is the morally indifferent process in which the most effective replicators out-reproduce the alternatives and come to prevail in a population by making the most copies of themselves. Natural selection is a blind process that favors those genes best able to survive and replicate themselves. Like Lady Justice, natural selection is a blind process once set in motion. It eliminates weaker genes in favor of stronger ones. For example, let's talk about the fast feet genes. I'm one of those guys that was born with slow feet. You were born with fast feet. We're walking through the forest and here comes a hungry tiger. We take off running. Those of you with the fast feet do what? Survive. Yeah, you survive because you run faster than those of us with the slow feet. Those of us with the slow feet fall behind, lag behind, and get eaten. Those with fast feet escape. Now those at fast feet got to grow to maturity, find a spouse, and have children. And those children more than likely are going to have fast feet. All the slow feeded people are going to get eaten eventually. And the fast feeded people are going to survive. So that at a certain point, we will have fast feeding humans on the planet. That's what it's saying. you got to hang on to it. There's going to be a twist coming. I promise. Okay. The question of God and natural selection are not adversarial. It is really not an either or issue. Nothing in this morally indifferent process, to use their language, of natural selection provides an explanation of the source or the beginning of the process. God and natural selection are not mutually exclusive terms. The latter is a process, the former is a creative designer. Neither term precludes the, precludes the other. 10,000 years ago, something happened on this planet. 8,000 B.C. or thereabouts. I don't care who you read, and you can almost pick up literature at will among all of these writers anymore. And they all will use a date of about 10,000 years ago. There is almost universal agreement, agreement that so-called modern humans appeared 10,000 years ago. We'll talk about this in greater detail in seminar four. The neo-evolutionists believe our species almost became extinct, but somehow a tiny few miraculously survived, flourished, and in only 10,000 years, there are now billions of us on this planet. I'm using their language for just a moment, please. During the Paleolithic age, it is likely more than 15 species of pre-humans existed with one another. Human wannabes. You've got to look at the language. They'll all talk and use the language humans. And then if you keep reading, they'll finally say, and modern humans showed up. And there's a distinction between modern human and these other so-called wannabes that they're talking about. Our ancestors passed through a population bottleneck and dwindled to a small number of individuals with a correspondingly small amount of genetic variation. The species survived and rebounded and underwent a population explosion after the invention of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. I'm actually quoting Pinker at this point. That explosion bred many copies of the genes of around when we were sparse in number. There has not been much time to accumulate many new versions of the genes. Modern humans are descendants of what the neo-evolutionists call a single founder population. 
All humans are therefore genetically related to one another. Now let me just say this real quick here. Among the geneticists, when they study our DNA, they have discovered that though there are billions of us on this planet, the genetic variation among all of us on this planet is extremely small. It is so small that they refer to us as a small species. The variety between us is what you would expect in a species that only had a hundred members or a thousand members, not billions. That means we have only existed such a short time, there simply has not been time enough for variation to have occurred. So genetically, if a geneticist is talking, he will verify that about 10,000 years ago, we are descended from a single founder population of at least one male and one female. <laughs> the chimpanzees, on the other hand, of which there's only a fraction of our number. If there's billions of us, there may be 50,000 of them or 100,000. They've got a genetic variation so broad that it would say they've been around 50,000 years. There's no way we're connected to them because we have only been who we are for 10,000 years. Now, the neat thing about those systems we talked about, those people that are counting by fives, they don't talk to people counting by sevens. Scientists who work by fives don't read scientists who are doing by sevens. Paleontologists don't read neontologists. Geneticists are not going to read uh, archaeologists. They don't read one another. They're inside their own little systems. But when we read across the systems, you begin to go, huh. We, modern humans, us, are all genetically related to each other and the descendant of a single founder population. That brings me to 27. If there was only two to begin with, one male and one female, or maybe three or four to give the evolutionists their chance, a small group of us, you see, I have to be neutral when I teach this in certain settings. How did we, biologically speaking, go from being only two to now being the largest species on the planet in only 10,000 years? What's at work here? What kind of fast feet are at work here that kept us surviving? If we dwindled to a single founder population, what caused us to reproduce so effectively that we dominate the planet? One clue, second paragraph, may be the universality of religious belief among all humans since the Neolithic Revolution. Geneticists believe that universal markers in human behavior are usually tied to a genetic factor. But what connection could exist between religiosity and gene replication? Oh, I've already got a headache. What is all that? I can see it coming. You see, these neo, it's important to understand they are saying natural selection is a morally indifferent process. It's blind, it's just going to work. Humans are humans because of our genetic makeup. My gen our genetic makeup is different from a chimpanzee or a gorilla, or an orangutan, or a lion, or, we're different. And the genetic makeup that we possess, we possess effective replicators that have outproduced any alternatives. For example, John Bowker in his book, Is God a Virus? 
asserts religion is universal because it protects gene replication and the nurturing of children. Bauter even suggests the potential for religiosity may even be genetically inherent in human brains. Now he's arguing against a couple of high-powered uh, neo-evolutionist atheists, uh, Richard Dawkins being the most famous of them, as well as E.O. Wilson. Wilson and Dawkins suggest the universality of religion throughout human history. See, when we say it's universal, how can you account for the fact, genetically, that every culture on this planet for 10,000 years has been religious. They haven't all worshipped the same deity, but they've all been religious. And if it's universal among us, it's got to be in our genes. Genetically, that's how it's transmitted. And so they're looking for this. And so Dawkins suggests the universality of religion throughout human history is explainable as a virus that infected the human genetic structure. We are religious because 10,000 years ago, we caught a cold. But if we caught a cold, and it gave us fat, fast feet and helped us survive, then it was a good thing. He would have to admit that he doesn't have to. This virus has effectively replicated itself until it became universal. Dawkins places a negative value on the empirical data and concludes that religions are bad because God is a virus that is harmful to the human race and should be stamped out. And he has set that as his mission. In fact, his latest book is The God Delusion. And uh, he's out beating our college students over the head in every classroom in America that you're stupid to believe in God. The significance for Bowker is just the opposite. He looks at the same data and comes to a different conclusion. Since humans are human because of their genetic structure, what if religiosity is included there? To take the case further, what if the genetic component that gives rise to religiosity is the interactive genetic ingredient that leads to effective genetic replication? What if being religious is what gives our species the edge. What if, starting from two, because they were religious, it gave the species a reproductive edge and we have multiplied, be fruitful and multiply, wasn't that the command? And we've obeyed it genetically? and reproduced ourselves, all descendants from the same biological parents that we came from. From an evolutionary point of view, mankind has survived the free-for-all genetic competition for survival precisely because its religious genetic component gave it a genetic replicative edge. But it is not enough to have an edge to reproduce. Some species, such as fish, lay multiple hundreds of eggs, but few survive to sexual maturity. They do not survive to have offspring of their own. I mean, fish have a thousand or a hundred, but not all of them make it to adulthood to get to then have, lay eggs themselves. Having this edge means not only out reproducing, it means out surviving them outliving them. It's not enough to have a bunch of offspring if the offspring don't survive. Human females normally give birth to one child at a time until modern era where we've got drugs that are being used. And I guess theoretically a human female might give birth 10 or 11 times in her lifetime. Usually it's considerably less than that, at least now. And so if you think about it, single birth pregnancies, and even if you had five pregnancies or ten pregnancies, wouldn't account for competition against species that have huge litters. So you'd think, okay, we're not having ten babies at a time. And so you would think having children, even if we're good at it, wouldn't give us an end if it takes being 14, 15, 16, 18 years to reach maturity, 
before they then have children. What's going on here that helps us survive as a species? I'm just talking biologically now, not religiously. Well, look on page 29. You see, these geneticists, man, they are saying, let's go get them. We're trying to erase all of the 13s off of the board. What number comes after 12? We can't have a 13. Research established a relationship between religious faith and physical health. The Center for the Study of Religion, Spirituality, and Health at Duke University. This is not a charismatic university. Duke University is not some fundamentalist, we all know that, right? Okay. They found that those who attend religious services or read, read scriptures frequently are significantly longer lived, less likely to be depressed, less likely to have high blood pressure, and nearly 90% less likely to smoke. Herbert Benson, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, discovered that those who practice meditation will use 17% less oxygen, lower their heart rates by three beats a minute, increase their brain waves, the ones you get right before sleep. The results were the same regardless of whether it's a Buddhist, a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim doing the meditating. In other words, meditation, religious meditation, has a health benefit inbuilt in us biologically, regardless of the content of our religion. Greg Jacobs, professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, recorded the EEGs of a group of meditators, and you can read this all later. I'm just wanting to lay the evidence out before you. The last paragraph on the page, at the University of Pennsylvania, neurologist Andrew Newberg, using radioactive dye, tracked the blood flow in the brain of a group of Buddhist meditators. Rather than shutting down during meditation, the brain blocks information from coming into the parietal lobe. Newberg's work confirmed a study done by Herbert Benson with Sikhs that showed during meditation overall blood flow was down, but in certain areas, including the limbic system, which generates emotions and memories, regulates heart rate, respiratory rate, metabolism, it was up. Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, using brain imaging, discovered that meditation shifts, shifts activity from the prefrontal cortex from the right hemisphere to the left. Next paragraph, separate research by the Duke University Medical Center, University of California at Berkeley, found that those who attend a house of worship improve their life expectancy. Those attending at least once a week had a 23% lower risk of dying. I had a student this semester in writing a, an extra credit report at the end of what they had learned this semester, quoted that statistic and said, I find that depressing since I'm not religious. <laughs> There's a health benefit, and they can't figure out how or why, but it's there. Item five, how about a relationship of prayer and health? Psychologists at Sheffield Hollow University in England discovered a link between praying and good mental health. The researchers writing in the British Journal of Health Psychology reported their findings suggest that the relationship between mental health and religion is linked to the way people use prayer to deal with stress. This finding would appear to support the view that a religious coping model is integral to the understanding of the relationship between re religiosity and psychological well-being. Rather than being nuts, religious people are psychologically healthy. Hmm. Even more astounding is a study done by the University of Maryland that found prayer and spiritual healing may assist in the healing process. Of the 23 clinical studies analyzed, 23 different studies, 57% reported a positive impact on patients. In one study of nearly 1,000 heart patients, those who were being prayed for without their knowledge suffered 10% fewer complications. A second study conducted by a university hospital in Kansas City, that's close by, isn't it? Found similar results. 500 heart patients selected at random without their knowledge 
were prayed for by volunteers from a local church who were given only a patient's first name and asked to pray for, quote, a speedy recovery with no complications. Now think of it. you got a big hospital. They go through using a random chart numbers, grab 500 names, take the first names only, come over to St. Elijah, got volunteers here, we fill the room, they give each one of us a name and a printed little prayer that says, uh, whatever it was that I just saw and I just lost it. Speedy, speedy a speedy recovery. Please give Mary a speedy recovery with no complications. Amen. That's all we're going to pray. Mary doesn't know I just prayed for her. John doesn't know you just prayed for him. They don't even know we're doing this. That's a federal lawsuit fixing to happen, probably. But <laughs> And when they did that, those that were prayed for had 11% less complications than the other group that we didn't pray for. With no rational explanation for the findings, the researchers said, we have not proven that God answers prayer or that God even exists. It was intercessory prayer, not the existence of God, that was being tested. So they at least proved that intercessory prayer is beneficial, I guess. These studies suggest a beneficial relationship between religious behavior and good health regardless of the content of the religion. Praying is beneficial whether one prays to Jesus, Buddha, the Divine Feminine, or Muhammad. Because it's inbuilt in us. For 10,000 years, humans have worshipped a variety of gods, goddesses, and deities. While there has been no universal religion, there has been a universal participation in religious behavior for 10,000 years. The health benefits associated with religious behavior may account for the repl repl replicative edge that helped our species survive. It is impossible to predict where genetic research will lead Genes only account for about 1.5% of the 3 billion letters of the human genetic alphabet. Regulatory and functional elements make up more than twice that. Eric Green of the National Human Genome Research Institute explained, we know how to find genes, but we don't know how to find non-genes that are functionally important. The scariest part is we don't even know where to look. Okay. Let me just help out a second. By the time we get to session four, we're going to talk about, and God created Adam and Eve in his own image. Unfortunately, we always use that as a metaphor and miss the reality that we have been created so there can be a connection between God and us. Everyone on this planet is made in the image of God. And we carry in our genes the ability to respond to God and even when we are responding to the wrong God, there is a health benefit inbuilt by our Creator to make being religious beneficial for all of us. That's what we've suggested so far. Using the godless language of a box that has no God in it, we see God at work in that box. Now it gets really specific on the top of page 32. Let's go looking for the God gene. This is what I got called in on the carpet about. Can't talk about the God gene in class. 
not only the genetic basis for the universality of religion that already has been discovered, but even the fingerprints of God may yet be found in the 95% of the genetic material yet to be discovered. Dean Hamer, a behavior geneticist at the National, National Cancer Institute, at the National Institutes of Health. This isn't small fries stuff. We're talking the high-powered genetic scientists in our country. After research has identified the VMAT2 gene as the so-called God gene. While this one gene might not make one a saint, a prophet, or a seer, it was enough to tip the spiritual scales and predispose one towards spirituality. Hamer is quick to make a distinction between spirituality and religion. He argues that spirituality is genetic while religion is cultural or part of our culture. Spirituality is rooted in that part of the brain where consciousness occurs, while religion is rooted in a different part of the brain where cognition occurs. Spirituality exists in the self-identifying awareness that a person is. Human consciousness exists genetically. Humans are aware they exist in the world. Part of the experience of this existence is the being conscious of being part of the larger whole. Spirituality refers to those moments of illumination when a person experiences self-transcendence. Genes control the production of menomines, which in turn create human consciousness and spirituality. Religion, on the other hand, does not exist genetically, but is inside of our culture. At the bottom of the page, religions are transmitted in a cultural way, while spirituality is transmitted genetically in human reproduction. Hamer investigated whether spirituality and religion were genetically based. He concluded that what people believe is learned. Religion is part of what we absorb from the culture we grow up in. As to spirituality, he concluded whether people believe and how deeply may be influenced by their genetic makeup. The content of religious ideas and traditions is cultural, whereas the predisposition to believe them may be at least partially genetic. So something happened 10,000 years ago. Perhaps the birth of modern humans is only the result of a fortuitous mutation that happened totally accidentally to a species. Perhaps the birth of modern humans is the result of a genetic virus that infected pre-humans and made us human. Or perhaps there is a God outside the box after all. Either way, Natural selection took that God gene and ran with it. And we've now got billions of us on the planet, all with fast feet being religious. Now what we've just done is dealt with the box. And in this box, there is no God. And these scientists make no bones about it. And they look for an answer to our existence, why we can think, why we would believe, why we have survived. They look for that answer inside the box. But in so doing, they keep finding 
that being religious is a good thing to people in the box. It is beneficial to us. It lets us live longer. It lets our offspring live longer. It is a good thing. They have discovered that there is a basis for being spiritual. That it has to do with our being conscious of ourselves and being part of a larger whole. Religions are an organized event we participate in. We're going to talk about that in our second half and be much more religious in the second half. I promise not to be scientific in the second half. They have tried to disprove and they can't. Every study they do comes back to we can't get rid of this. The studies come back to something happening about 10,000 years ago in 8,000 B.C. Our topic tonight is, I believe in God. One of the reasons believing in God is possible is because we possess, were created with, dare I say, the ability to believe. And we're not geneticists, most of us, I dare say. But to the geneticists, if we have the ability to believe, there has to be a gene that lets us be that. And they believe it is the V. Matt 2 gene. They may discover that it's a different gene. It doesn't matter. But the point is, we believe. It is not nonsense to have a 13, which stands for belief in God, in your system. They can't tolerate believing in God in their system. But when you look inside the box, it keeps describing us with the capacity for being spiritual. And every survey that the Gallup organization does always says 95% of the American population believe they're spiritual or religious while only 25% go to church. We were created to be spiritual. We're hardwired genetically with the ability to be believers. Now, what we believe and how we come to believe what we believe is a different story. And when we come back after our break in a few minutes, what we want to look at is this. Not the God that's not in the box, but the God who is outside of the box. And it is the God who is outside of the box who taps us on the shoulder and revelation takes place. And that's what we want to look at next together. Let's look at faith. Let's now be religious, not scientists. But for those of you that have been beat up with a professor or in your secular world, know that 
Everyone around you thinks you're nuts for being religious, and so none of us dare appear religious in public. And I'm not saying we have to be religious kooks in public. But if you sometimes feel intimidated about, I don't know if I can believe or not believe. I don't know. Hmm. The reason we just spent this first hour together tonight is to give you hope that we actually were created by the God outside the box in such a way that we are religious and that when he taps us on the shoulder, we can feel the tap. That's what we have just looked at. Well, that's a good time to take an aspirin. I just feel like it. <laughs> Thank you for being patient and surviving a science lecture. For crying out loud, it's Wednesday night. What am I doing here? We're going to take a break, and uh, we'll come back in just a few minutes. Quick question. Um, so, the are they saying that everybody has that gene, but it's more pronounced than some people? Or because they said that we all have a disposition to spirituality? It comes from the VMAT gene. The question is, do we all have the VMAT gene? I think the answer is yes. We all have a predisposition to be religious. We also have free will. And what free will does is the war inside each one of us to believe or not to believe, which is what we're going to look at when we come back then. Have they mapped a gene for free will? Not that I know of. <laughs> okay, let's, we're going to have a little longer break tonight so we can give our kids a chance to stop spinning, and then we'll come back and be religious to get started. We're now on page 33, Roman numeral 3. Let's talk about God outside of the godless box. When I use the term godless box, I mean the box has a kicked him out. We've discovered that he's there after all, but they don't want to count by ones to find him. Our nine dot reminder, if you remember, of course, I've done it again. It showed up without a eraser. You got the nine dots. And you have to come out of the box. You cannot stay in the box. But no one can get out of the box themselves. It takes revelation. We're using the nine dot problem to illustrate to us that it takes the God who is outside the box to break into our world to get us outside of the box. Even Richard Dawkins, and let me just mention uh, his book, that I'm going to quote from it in just a second, uh, Why God Won't Go Away, the scientist Newberg is looking at all this brain brain stuff, uh, the God gene, the guy that's at the National Institutes of Health and, and so forth. There's all kinds of books out there. It's a, it's a brand new, wide open field, and one side's hurling at the other side and so forth. But if you just read through and get some scientific data and begin to count all the dots, it, it's interesting, I think. But Richard Dawkins, who is a militant atheist, asked Jim Watson of the DNA Human uh, Genome Project. Watson was one of the founders of the project. Quote, whether he knew, I'm on the bottom of 33, whether I knew many religious scientists today, and he replied, virtually none. Occasionally I meet them, and I'm a bit embarrassed. And he laughed, because, you know, I can't believe anyone accepts truth by revelation. That's the crisis. If you're in the box, you have cut yourself off from the possibility of anything outside the box happening. Revelation is something that happens by the God who is outside the box. It's not something we do. If we believe in a God, we inside the box cannot think our way to Him. Only He can break into our 
lives or our world. I said to Watson, some people see no conflict between science and religion because they claim science is about how things work and religion is about what it's all for. Watson retorted, well, I don't think we're for anything. We're just products of evolution. That's pretty just cut and dry. Okay. Then Dawkins cuts to the heart of the matter. Believing is not something you can decide to do as a matter of policy. At least it's not something I can decide to do as an act of will. I can decide to go to church. I can decide to recite the Nicene Creed. And I can decide to swear on a stack of Bibles that I believe every word inside them. But none of that can make me actually believe it if I don't. And he's telling the truth. It's not just going to church, reading the book. It's not just saying lip service, I believe. Is there really something called belief? That's what we're looking at this six weeks together, remember? So belief is not a matter of policy, item three. It's not a matter of choosing which nine dot system we prefer. I remember all the pretty little boxes we did. There's all kinds of them. Inside the box, all solutions are man-made answers. It makes no difference which solution we choose. Uh, if they all fail, every one of those left at least one dot empty. Uh, so it's just a preference of which one you think you. If, as your money takes your choice of which one of those failures you want to live with uh, that's there. No, belief is a matter of revelation. Belief is a matter of the God outside the box interrupting our lives and revealing himself to us. We have a phone. I admit to bring my cell phone with me just so I can visually say, we have a phone. <laughs> had I been tricky, I'd have had one of you call me about now and ring. You know. <laughs> it takes a phone to get a phone call. It takes a phone to get a phone call. Now, if we don't have a phone, how can God call us? Genetically, we have a phone. Genetically, we have the ability to respond to the God who is outside of the box. We possess spirituality. We Inside the box, we can, we can invent religions. But we can also respond to the God who is outside the box when he calls. If we have our genetic phone. Now there is no religious content in our genes. It's not inside the box. Every human baby born healthy is capable of learning any human language at birth. Had I been born in China, I'd be speaking Chinese. They didn't bring me home from the hospital and say, oops, you can't have him. He needs to speak Chinese and ship me off somewhere else. Every human baby possesses the capacity of learning every language on the planet the moment they're born. We end up learning the language of our mother. That's why it's called the mother tongue. Politics is the father, we call that the father land, but our language is our mother tongue. We're not born programmed for only one language. We're also not born believing in any specific deity or religion. We're born with the capacity to be spiritual and to believe in a deity and can practice a religion. And so just like with language, where we learn the language of our parents, most people usually start out believing the religion or non-religion of their parents. So from a purely speculative point of view, which deity or deities should I worship? Should I worship any at all? I'll never forget a young man turned, I think, 18, got in his car, 
started driving down May Avenue on his quest. We were the first church coming from the north that he came to, pulled in, came in and introduced himself. Hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm on a quest. I've decided I'm going to go to every church in town and find the true religion. I've been raised such and such all my life. Now I'm going to go search it out for myself. He never got any further south than 15,000 <laughs> north of <man. laughs> But which one shall I worship? If all we have are nine dot religions inside the box, then in a real sense, it really doesn't matter which one you believe. We can all be good old Protestant denominational sin. It doesn't matter which denomination you're part of. Uh, we could argue that there are nuances of differences between religions that are hostile and killing people and so forth, but there's still this man-made religions inside of a, a system. But if there is a God outside the box, and if you're looking at the bottom of page 35, if you were to start, start at the left-hand bottom corner and go to the who on your right, who interrupts our lives, and then go up diagonally through those next two dots that will lead you up to the who is at the top, and we're then to come back down to your starting point, and then go diagonally through the center, it makes all the difference in the world when we're dealing with the God who is outside the box. The God who is, and the God who interrupts our lives. So we have a phone. And on the top of 36, when the phone rings, answer it. I'm going to do something that I very seldom do when I teach, and it's not my custom much. But I'm going to be personal for the rest of the evening. Uh, a man born blind that we looked at in John chapter 9 last week said, This one thing I know, whereas I used to be blind, now I see. I'm going to describe to you how I went from blindness to sight, or if you will, how I got rescued out of the box. And I'll do this as quickly and as, and as summary fashion as I can. I remember when I was eight years old making a conscious decision to embrace my parents' faith by consciously walking an aisle down to the front of the church and saying I believe and asking to be baptized, which I then received baptism. However, when I was 13 years old, or maybe 14, I got angry at God. Uh, we had merged two junior highs in town, and my junior high came from the wrong side of town, and we were the odd kids out that one of the popular girls from the right side of town had asked me to go to a church event at her church. And I desperately wanted to go, but I had come down with a summer cold of some sort and was sick as a dog. And I needed to get well in three days. And so I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. <laughs> and I didn't get healed. Well, I showed my parents had got any way. I went sick. Had the worst time of my life. Of course, she never talked to me again, and I never talked to her. Uh, never had a date again or anything like that. But I guess I made a vow unknown to myself. I just won't believe in you anymore. I don't consciously remember thinking that, but subconsciously, well, I'll show you. I just won't believe in you anymore. And so from that moment on, uh, if someone asked me what I was, I would have said, oh, I'm probably a good atheist. I just don't believe anymore. And for about five years, I went to church every Sunday with my parents, was elected president of the youth group, and didn't believe in God anymore. Five years after that, when I was 18 years old, an event happened where a buddy of mine was speaking at the Baptist church and uh, I was touched by what he had to say 
And I remember that Sunday night going home uh, a little bit troubled because he had been a strong believer. And I actually knelt by my bed that night before going to sleep. And I said something like probably, God, if you're real, save me. In those days, of course, I meant from a Calvinistic hellfire and damnation of this angry God who was out to kill me. But uh, now I know I was saying, I've gotten myself entangled in unbelief and I can't get out. Save me from my unbelief. Regardless of whatever words I used, before I could put the period on the sentence, something happened on the inside of me and I knew that I had been rescued out of the field of unbelief that I had stumbled into. I remembered having the worst night of sleep I've ever had in my life, tossing and turning, probably talking in my sleep. And the first conscious thought I had the next morning when I woke up is, I have been called to preach. In a Baptist world, that's the only thing you can be called to do. I had been called to serve God or to follow God in some sort of service. That's what I was saying. So I graduated from high school and I went off as a preacher boy to a religious college. And I touched on that last week with you, that in my required Old Testament class and New Testament class, decided there was nothing to believe in, so I just put my Bible on the shelf and instead of majoring in religion, started majoring in philosophy, which I did. But I couldn't shake that one single event when I had knelt by my bed. And so I still signed up for seminary. And why are you going to seminary? I'm going to see if there's anything left to believe in. And again, I touched on this last week, so I won't dwell here. But if I thought there was nothing to believe in after college, I was totally convinced of that after seminary. After we destroyed the Old Testament, the New Testament, and everything else that might be around. So, I remember being about 25 years old in the seminary bookstore, maybe my senior year, browsing for what good book I could get, and any time I got a gift of some money, I'd go buy a book. And so I'm browsing, and I came across a book there. There was a rack, an InterVarsity Press rack, which, in the arrogance of my academic education, I knew to really not be worth my time, since it was conservative, trite stuff, but I looked anyway, and I picked up a book by a man by the name of Francis Schaeffer, and I judged his book by whether what he had to say about Rudolf Bultmann, the great German liberal theologian, so I flipped to the back, and sure enough, he's listed, and I flipped to the page where his name was, and he essentially said, Bultmann was wrong. And I went, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut his book, put it back. I did not know it, but my phone was ringing. I just didn't hear it that day in that bookstore. A year later, uh, I'm on my way making a journey to, that took me via Nuremberg, Germany, before going to graduate school in Switzerland. And some people in the state said, oh, you're headed to Switzerland. Uh, are you going to go to Labrie when you're there? Labrie being the place that Francis and Edith Schaefer did their theological, philosophical work from in Switzerland. And I said, no, they have nothing to offer me. This time the phone might have been ringing and I heard it, but I decided I wasn't going to answer it. Yet. So I go off overseas, and I'm going to fast forward on the top of page 37 to January 1980. 
I now find myself without a job, almost out of money. Uh, I had enough money to last through January. Uh, and the only thing I had left to believe in in January of 1980 was that when I was 18 years old, I had knelt beside my bed and an event happened inside of me that I could not doubt had happened. And I'd been out hustling for jobs, none would come along. And in my despair, I had gone to, to all the, the places. Uh, we didn't have bishops, so you went to, to a Baptist association group. The guy looked at me, pulled out a drawer, it had 250 resumes in it. He tossed mine in there and says, you haven't got a chance. So in that total despair, I remember praying this outlandish prayer. God, you called me to preach. I did not call me to preach. It's up to you to find me a place to serve you. It's not up to me to go find a place to serve you. So I'm going to quit trying. I have enough money to make it till the end of the month. And if you haven't come through by then, I quit being a preacher. And I will maybe still believe in you, but I will not work for you anymore. It wasn't a threat, it was just despair. The next afternoon, my phone rang. I was sitting out on my front porch, quiddling on a two-by-four. That's what I did. That's what I was going to do for the rest of January. <laughs> <laughs> the phone rang, and the man who had told me he had 250 names on file and I didn't have a chance was calling saying he had just had a church call him and he thought I was their man and would I go on a Sunday night to a neutral site and give a sermon. They would be planted in the audience and then they would chat with me later if they thought it was worth chatting with me about. So I did that. Uh, they asked to speak with me afterwards. We chatted, and then they invited me to come to their church the following week, uh, what was called in those circles, uh, to preach in view of a call. And so I was to go speak on Sunday morning and Sunday night. So on that Sunday morning, I took my last $10 and put gasoline in my car to drive the 20 miles to that church. And I spoke, and then spoke again, that night, they asked me to stay while they took their vote among the congregation of whether they wanted me uh, to be their pastor or not. And they voted that they would ask me to do the job. And so I was grateful to now have a job. And then the church secretary came up to me and handed me a check. And I said, what's this? And she said, it's your first week's salary we pay in advance. I had spent my last $10 that morning and had prayed to God that if I didn't have a job by the time I was out of money, I wouldn't serve him officially again. The phone was ringing. Three hours later, I received a phone call from the ICU ward of a hospital uh, saying that a member of this church that I was now the pastor of was dying, and I went to the hospital. They had amputated the man's leg, the family was there. I looked into his face, I looked into the wife's face, the son and daughter's face, and they needed answers I did not possess. And I remember when I left the hospital saying, I will not be a hypocrite to these people. And out of my selfishness, I said, God, would you please let this man live long enough for me to see if I can find answers. 
for people facing death. My nice liberal theology that counted by tens or twelves or twenties, somehow death wasn't in the picture in that theology. Please let this man live so I can find something for him and us to believe in. He lived five months, died just after July the 4th. One week later, his seven-year-old niece died. I was in the hospital room when she died. First time I'd ever witnessed a person dying. And on that day, my nine-dot man-made theology died with her. I gave up all efforts of trying to figure out a way to make sense inside the box. And in the 1st of August, after the funerals were over, I went into a Christian bookstore. And I remember standing outside the door saying, I need help. And if there is a book in this bookstore that will help me begin to make sense and find you, direct me to it. It was a huge bookstore, not a tiny one. Somehow, I walked in and almost directly went over and picked up this book by Francis Schaeffer, The God Who Is There. The same book I had picked up in the seminary bookstore those earlier years. This time when the phone rang, I bought the book. Read the book read the next one that came with it, and escaped from reason. And then I read the one that probably put the nail in the coffin for me. He is there, and he is not silent. That's the two dots outside of the box. He is there, and he is not silent. I ended up reading every book, bought every book that Francis Schaeffer wrote. Little by little crawled out of philosophy. Read every book that his wife wrote. My wife eventually gave me the complete collected works of the whole deal in a nice bound set. And so there was this total reversal of this sequence of what comes after 12. It was like a slow climb through the years, making my way upward to getting back to seeing that we count by one, two, three, four. Now Francis Schaeffer didn't get out of the box. He got close. I didn't get out of the box because of Francis Schaeffer, but I got close. And I was the book Labrie. I, I brought this from our kitchen. It's still in our kitchen. It's got the recipe for a chocolate sauce we've used with all of our children. And it became a cookbook for us because it had Edith's recipes in it she used in Switzerland. It, God is so good, slaps me with my ear against every day. You know, nah, I don't need that. Oh, yes, you do. The phone is ringing. Over and over and over, the phone was ringing, and I didn't know how to answer it. So I'm now at this place. I know that I don't want part, any part of a man made box man-made system, but I don't know what else there is. And then the burning bush started burning. 1988, Quell Springs Mall, I bumped into a former member of the church I was pastoring in Guthrie. 
he was looking for something that he didn't find in the little church I was pastoring. And when I saw him, that he was changed. There was something in his face, and I blurted out, my God, what's happened to you? And he goes, I found the church. And I know that sounds arrogant, but it didn't sound arrogant to me that day. He was so sincere, and the change was so real. And I said, tell me about it. So he took, and he and his wife took Kathy and me over to the Black Eyed Pea that used to be over here. And we had dinner together, and he told about finding St. Elijah Orthodox Church. Started talking about these classes. We didn't have to turn aside. We could have said, that's nice. But somehow, maybe the arrogance had been beaten out of me at this point. Maybe I was finally pliable in the hands of God. I don't know. But like Moses, I said, I think I'll turn aside and see this sight. And so Kathy and I went to the inquirer's classes, like many of you have done. They were on Sunday afternoon in those days. Four o'clock in the afternoon, I think. So we'd go, four to six, got a babysitter for the kids, went out and got something to eat later, went home, kind of had a day. Heard stuff I'd never heard before, off the radar kinds of stuff. Couldn't understand most of it. It was interesting. Then they bring in a guest speaker, John Braun, Father John Braun, going to talk about sex. Best of the lectures I'd ever heard. Never heard lectures on sex in the churches I came out of. <laughs> that was taboo. Came back later, maybe took the classes one more time. You know, Father Constantine comes to me and goes. Of course, at this point, I'm beginning to go, is there really such a church? Did, did, did God really build a church? I thought there was only man-made churches. I didn't know there might be that God actually, by revelation, revealed a church. Like he revealed everything else. So Father Constantine comes to me, knowing I'm a professional student, I guess, and says, I want to sign you up for the St. Stephen's course. It doesn't matter. I got the money to pay for it. So he signs me up. I get my first set of questions after you've studied to get them in the spring. Discuss the doctrine of deification or theosis. Yikes. That doesn't, those words are not in my Baptist vocabulary, I assure you. <laughs> And I promised myself that I was going to attempt to do my best to understand what these Orthodox people meant by those terms. I wasn't going to argue it. I wasn't going to debate it. I wasn't going to be the goat. But, 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 but. I was going to see if I could accurately understand whatever it was they taught. And I have to have included that document I wrote just for academic purposes, I guess, in your deal. You don't have to turn to it, but it's there. And when I got it back, and it got good marks, I realized that I had kind of grasped what was being said. I quit the course. There was absolutely no reason to take another course until I digested that one paper I had just written. Because if it was true, then everything I had believed my entire life was wrong. About salvation, about there being a purpose for creation. And it took me about two years 
to digest that reality. Our seventh and last child, our only daughter, was born in, right after Thanksgiving of 1990. And by January, inside <coughs> myself, I knew I had become orthodox. That the God who is outside the box had climbed me out of the box into his church. That last Sunday in January, 1991, unlike the last Sunday in January of 1980, when I was filled with no belief and such despair, I stood before that small parish in Guthrie and told them why I was no longer a Protestant and resigned. And then on Monday, I called Father Constantine, told him that I had done so, and said, we would like to come to St. Elijah and become members. And we didn't know how to become members. We had never worshipped at St. Elijah because I always preached on Sundays. So we had never seen a worship service. And the first Sunday in February, 1991, we arrived. <coughs> to begin the journey of entrance into the church. And we've now completed about 17 years of walking with God in the cool of the evening, walking with this God who is outside of the box. I've been very, very personal with you, and I normally don't, because I want you to know the God who is outside the box is there and he is not silent. We do have a telephone and when it rings we need to learn how to hear it and to answer it. So what do I believe about God? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered, and was buried. And the third day rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. These things, I believe. Thank you for being part of us this evening for our second seminar. I look forward to our being together again next week, God willing, as we look at our third topic together. God bless you. Thank you.